we've repeatedly offered to help Ethiopia's leaders pursue a different path. And as we've engaged, we've been transparent in sharing our analysis of the situation in northern Ethiopia. We believe that the parties to the conflict have committed rampant human rights abuses and atrocities. There have been credible, documented, persistent reports by a wide range of sources about these abuses and atrocities. Looting, displacement, executions, reports of rape and sexual violence as a tool of war with the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, the Eritrean Defense Forces, the Amhara Special Forces, and the TPLF, all implicated to some degree. We continue to carefully monitor and assess the human rights situation and will carefully consider in our own review the upcoming joint report by the United Nations and Ethiopian human rights officials. You know, the conflict, of course, has not been static, and we've adapted our message accordingly. There's been a major shift since late June when the TPLF forces seized control of Mekele, the regional capital of Tigray, and alarmingly, since July, the TPLF has widened the conflict in misery into the neighboring states of Afar and Amhara, displacing hundreds of thousands of additional victims of this needless war. Ambassador Passi and Addis and, and USAID's head of humanitarian assistance recently visited Bahadar, the regional capital of Amhara, as we accelerate our efforts to reach those displaced by the TPLF. The stories they relayed back to us are heartbreaking. We watched the fighting around the, the cities of Desi and, Kom, and Kompacha in horror as thousands more civilians were forced to leave their homes. Some critics of US policy claim the United States has an inherent bias in favor of the TPLF. This could not be further from the truth. We have consistently condemned the TPLF's expansion of the war outside Tigray, and we continue to call on the TPLF to withdraw from Afar and Amhara. That expansion of the war, however, is as predictable as it is unacceptable given that the Ethiopian government began cutting off humanitarian relief and commercial access to Tigray in June, which continues to this day despite horrifying conditions of reported widespread famine and near famine conditions that have shocked the world. In Tigray, 90% of the population requires, requires aid and up to 90, 900,000 people are facing famine-like conditions. This is happening in a country that has the expertise and the experience to address famine, if the will were there. To meet the basic needs of Tigray's population of 7 million, the UN has been clear. At least 2,000 trucks of supplies are needed per month. Since the beginning of July, only 1,100 trucks in total have entered Tigray which is just 13% of what's required. Now, there was a welcome increase of food deliveries in September and early October, but this still, still fell short of the needs. No new convoys of humanitarian assistance have been able to enter Tigray due to lack of approval since October 18. Fighting and insecurity have disrupted some convoys and flights. And there, and there have been occasional shortages of, of trucks due to some very complicated issues. But without question, the most serious obstacles are intentional gov government delays and denials. Moreover, the government has rejected the delivery of almost all medical supplies to Tigray since July. In practice, this means that those suffering from malnutrition or, rot or routine or long-term illnesses cannot be effectively treated. You know, food alone does not save those whose bodies are already consuming themselves because of famine. The government has also not allowed the importation of fuel into Tigray since early August. Humanitarian agencies need fuel inside the region to be able to distribute aid outside the capital. Three of the seven main, main food delivery partners had to suspend activities because of fuel shortages. The UN World Food Program suspended its operations in Tigray. The remaining food delivery partners fear that leaving fear that fuel shortages will prevent them from continuing any deliveries outside of Mekele, leaving millions more vulnerable to food insecurity. 
Disruptions to banking services and the prohibition by the government of Ethiopia on cash entering Tigray also hinder aid delivery. And the government's unprecedented expulsion of key UN officials, more UN humanitarian staff expelled in a single day by the Ethiopian government than Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria has expelled in 10 years of civil war, and the investigation, and in some cases, closure of internationally renowned human right, human humanitarian organizations further erodes the ability of the international community to reach those in need, and not only in Tigray, but also those victims of the TPLF incursions in Afar and Amhara, who we are committed to help. This unfortunately suggests an intentional effort by the authorities to deprive Ethiopians who are suffering of receiving life-saving assistance. Now, I'm familiar with the arguments that food, fuel, and trucks can be diverted to TPLF war efforts. But my experience proves that such concerns can be satisfactorily addressed. For example, after initial delays and problems, the Israelis, who have genuine security concerns with the Gaza Strip, and the Saudis, who have legitimate security concerns about attacks on their territory originating in Yemen, have signed off on creative procedures for screening cargo headed to Gaza in certain areas of Yemen that address security concerns but also permit food, fuel, and medicine to reach needy populations in Gaza and Yemen. The United States and the UN agencies and NGOs to which we provide funding all have stringent monitoring requirements to mitigate diversion, which is illegal under US law. The humanitarian conditions in Tigray are unacceptable. No government can tolerate an armed insurgency. We get that. But no government should be adopting policies or allowing practices that result in mass starvation of its own citizens. The United States has not been alone in articulating these concerns. Back in June, leaders of the G7 expressed alarm at the worsening situation and called for an end to the fighting and to allow unimpeded humanitarian access. The UN Secretary General has been increasingly outspoken about his concerns, saying a humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding before our eyes. He has urged an immediate cessation of hostilities, unrestricted humanitarian access, and dialogue among all parties to resolve the crisis. The European Union and European leaders have spoken out. African leaders have also become increasingly concerned. Last month, President Kenyatta told the UN Security Council there must be action toward a negotiated ceasefire and ending the humanitarian crisis. The African Union appointed former Nigerian President Obasanjo as high representative to help the parties to the conflict reach a negotiated settlement. As the war approaches its one year anniversary, the United States and others cannot continue business as usual relations with the government of, Eth of Ethiopia. The extraordinary partnership we have enjoyed is not sustainable while the military conflict continues to expand, threatening the stability and the unity of one of Africa's most influential countries, threatening the and the fundamental well-being of its people. The United States, and other donors have, have already limited significant amounts of development assistance in Ethiopia in an effort to dissuade the government from this harmful path. We have conveyed to Ethiopia that it is at risk of losing important benefits under the African Growth and Opportunity Act, a GOA, if human rights violations are not addressed. This is due to the stringent human rights criteria for a GOA eligibility required by Congress under US law. The United States is prepared to pursue the first sanctions under the executive order President Biden signed in September um, against those fueling this crisis and obstructing humanitarian operations. And we will be targeting all parties implicated. While Ethiopian officials have attempted to separate the conduct of the war from the Ethiopian-US bilateral relationship, there is a direct causal relationship between what is happening on the ground as a result of the policies of the Ethiopian government and the actions of the other belligerents and the subsequent decisions that have been taken or are being contemplated by the US administration. It gives us no pleasure 
to think about visa restrictions or sanctions or having Ethiopia lose trade benefits and, and preferences. The historically strong Ethiopian-U.S. relationship grew under Prime Minister Abe with new programs and new hopes that I described. The unfortunate deterioration in our relationship derives from the atrocities of the conflict in northern Ethiopia and the reports of the use of food as a weapon of war, which as UN Security Council Resolution 2417 reiterates, may constitute a war crime. We are reacting to behavior no person of conscience can accept, and in the manner which should come as no surprise to any party to the conflict. We've attempted to maintain a frank and open dialogue with the government. Instead of responding to our concerns and our offer to support mediation of the conflict, many in the government falsely assert that the United States seeks to replace the Abiy government with another TPLF-dominated regime. This is just not true. We know full well and respect the views of the overwhelming majority of the Ethiopian public who oppose a return to a Mellis style rule. This is not 1991, when the TPLF led the forces that, dis that discharged the hated Mengisto regime. And let me be clear, we oppose any TPLF move to Addis or any attempt by the TPLF to besiege Addis. This is a message we have also underscored in our engagement with TPLF leaders. The United States seeks a relationship with all peoples in Ethiopia. We want to see stability and prosperity restored to the entire country and for Ethiopia to regain its position as a regional and global leader. Such an outcome requires Ethiopia's leaders to put down their guns and find a formula for peaceful coexistence. We had hoped that the recent political events inside Ethiopia would have led the prime minister to pivot from war to peace. Elections in June and September produced a super, a super parliamentary majority for prime minister's prosperity party. You know, as the former UN focal point for election assistance, which is one of the responsibilities I had as undersecretary general for political affairs, you know, I have some concerns about elections when key opposition figures are imprisoned um, and restrictions on the media are imposed. But I also believe that the Prosperity Party has significant support across Ethiopia as reflected in those election results. This means the prime minister indeed has a mandate he can draw on in a new cabinet composed of hand-picked trusted allies and partners. He was sworn in for a full five-year ter five term. But as Kenyan President Kenyatta said at that, at that very swearing in, the mandate obligates the prime minister to govern for those who supported him and for those who did not. Legitimacy can never be sustained through force or proclaimed by fiat. The prime minister now has the, the power and the opportunity to embrace peace. Instead, we see the situation getting worse, not better. The government has exploited longstanding ethnic grievances with divisive rhetoric. It has launched a bombing campaign while using drones from questionable sources including reportedly from U.S. adversaries and promoted mass mo mobilization of militia, doing grave damage to Ethiopia's security institutions. Scarce foreign currency reserves have diverted to arms purchases and lobbyists rather than development. The TPLF, meanwhile, pushes ahead in Amhar and forges alliance with disaffected groups, with disaffected armed groups elsewhere in the country. Th this is dangerous. The situation on the ground today is even more alarming than it was a few months ago. And that whispering phenomenon in Addis that I found so indicative back on the margins of Mellis' funeral in 2012, oh, it's back. And the democratic opening that was so inspiring when Abi Ahmed became prime minister appears to be at risk of being another victim of this war. Studies show that the average modern civil war now lasts 20 years. I repeat, 20 years. A multi-decade civil war in Ethiopia would be disastrous for its future and for its people. We urge the government of Ethiopia, the TPLF, the other belligerents, to give peace a chance. 
to, to, to choose a different path and engage in dialogue without preconditions, whether through direct contact or via an intermediary such as former Nigerian President Obasanjo and his role as African Union High Representative, the government of Ethiopia and the TPLF should commence at once with negotiating and implementing a series of parallel steps that will stop the violence, allow life-saving <clears throat> access to Tigray, lead the TPLF to withdraw from Afar and Amhara and the Eritrean forces from Ethiopia, result in a durable ceasefire, perhaps with the rules understood and perhaps with third-party monitors, and initiate accountability for human rights abuses and any war crimes. Ethiopians can set an agenda for talks on issues including internal border disputes and the role of the central government versus the federal states that must be resolved peacefully and constitutionally between Ethiopians rather than through violence. There are many reciprocal steps the parties could take now to move toward a negotiated ceasefire. The first step, though, is demonstrating an openness to try. As I told a group of Ethiopian officials during a private retreat we hosted in June in Washington, the Ethiopian-U.S. relationship was then at a crossroads. I think the same is true for Ethiopia's broader relations with an important cross-section of the international community. We could proceed down one path that would inevitably lead to sanctions and other measures, or we go down another path on which we could revitalize the positive, promising bilateral relationship that was expanding to new heights under Prime, when Prime Minister Abiy took office. The United States wants the latter. We sincerely want to chart a more productive path out of the current crisis. We do not want Ethiopia to lose its AGOA trade benefits or its international assistance. We are prepared to exercise leadership in the international community to energize the support needed for Ethiopia's recovery from war and to realize the prime minister's ambitious economic and job creation agenda. That remains our desired destination. But I emphasized the June delegation, as I have repeatedly conveyed to the prime minister and other senior officials before and since, Ethiopia, not the United States, is in the driver's seat. Prolonging the war, dodging genuine negotiations to lead to de-escalation, negotiated ceasefire, and refusing to allow unhindered humanitarian access to avert catastrophe are actions that are taking Ethiopia to a dangerous direction. Unfortunately now, at the beginning of November, that crossroads that I described back in June is now behind us. It's not too late to retrace our steps toward the path not taken. But the change in direction must occur in days, uh, not weeks. It requires the Ethiopian government to address concerns that we've been raising for months. And we're also insisting that the TPLF stop its military advance, refrain from threatening at us, and prepare for talks. Eritrea must cease its destructive interference and withdraw its troops entirely from, from Ethiopia. I am prepared to travel to Addis at, at any time to resume dialogue and assist, working alongside African Union High Representative Obasanjo and other international leaders. Our priority is the unity and integrity of the Ethiopian state and our commitment is to the Ethiopian people. And consistent with that commitment, we will continue to try to provide extensive humanitarian assistance across Ethiopia. Despite the circumstances, I'm proud that the United States currently provides more humanitarian assistance to Ethiopia than, any other, than, than does any other country in the world. And our significant development assistance package makes long-term investments in key areas such as public health, education, agriculture, and democracy and human rights. The United States was the largest bilateral donor to Ethiopia before November 2020. And even now, with all the difficulties and restrictions I've described, we remain so. In closing, I want to note that my, that my remarks have concentrated primarily on the war in northern Ethiopia. Since the violence, humanitarian catastrophe, and atrocities in northern Ethiopia, that is Tigray, 
Amhara, Afar, are the issues that are prompting U.S. considerations of new measures, including sanctions under the new executive order and the question of AGOA eligibility. But we are also deeply concerned with violence and tensions elsewhere in Ethiopia. If not addressed through dialogue and consensus, these problems can contribute to the deterioration of the integrity of the state. Ending the war in northern Ethiopia will allow government officials and others to concentrate on the processes necessary to address tensions elsewhere and to rebuild an Ethiopian national consensus on the country's future that includes enduring protection of the rights of members of minority groups. Such a process is necessary to restore Ethiopia's role as a cornerstone of stability in the Horn of Africa, and that Ethiopian leadership that is so familiar to me from my UN tenure. Ending the war is the best path to a more stable, more prosperous country. And ending the war will also enable us to renew a more affirmative Ethiopian-US bilateral relationship, a partnership that benefits both countries. We urge Ethiopian leaders from all parties to take the steps necessary to arrest the current trajectory and permit its peoples and its partners to restore the promise that Prime Minister Abiy so compellingly outlined at the start of his premiership. Ambassador, thank you for your deeply thoughtful, impressive, and wholly important comments and observations on the Horn of Africa, and very particularly on Ethiopia. With your permission, we've collected a number of questions that have come from across the U.S. government, from many stakeholders in the Horn of Africa, from people who have lived there, people who are in the diaspora, and from the media. We'd like to start our first question with one about Sudan. Ah. So of course, the- I think we're joined by Ambassador Sati. Ambassador, warmly welcome. Um, you know, all of the countries in the Horn of Africa are linked politically, economically, socially, culturally. What happens in one impacts what happens everywhere else. I think all of us have watched with deep worry what's happened in Sudan with the military coup, the detention of activists, people who have been killed in the protests. We, I know, share with everyone our condolences for the people who have lost, ones who have loved. We recognize the many efforts that are underway by civic and security actors who are trying to forge a way forward in the country. How do you see the events in Sudan and what do you think the events in Sudan, what's the impact of them on Ethiopia? Well, Lise, thanks for the question. Of course, I also want to acknowledge that you yourself have extensive experience in Sudan and South Sudan. Um, during your, your United Nations career. Um, let me step back a bit um, and look at the region as a whole. And of course, this is, this is what the Red Sea Study Group that USIP hosted was trying, was trying to do, as, um, I think, very successfully as well. What's the United States' overriding interest? We have lots of interests around the world, but our overriding interest in the Horn of Africa is stability. You know, Ethiopia is a country of 115 million people, um, Sudan is, is 40, some million, 40 some million people, approaching 50 million people. Um, these are countries located in a strategic part of the world, the, the Red Sea Basin. Our interest is stability. And our, con our concern on Ethiopia, um, again, derives from a number of factors that I said today, but our goal is to see a stable Horn of Africa where, where Ethiopia is playing its traditional leadership role and where the, Sudanese, where the Sudanese people are able to achieve their aspirations for a democratic transition that we believe is the cornerstone of stability in, in Sudan at this point. So we're obviously alarmed by what took place on October 25th by the hijacking of the democratic transition by the, by the military authorities. Um, and we've, you know, we've been public in our, in our call for the release of all, of all detainees um, the ability of the prime minister to get out from under house arrest and resume resume his you know his leadership his leadership role. But what motivates us are the 
in Sudan are the aspirations of the Sudanese people for the peaceful transition, but again, our interest in stability that we think only comes about if you have a successful dem democratic, tran democratic transition. Ambassador, I know that when you took up your role, the conflict in Tigray had already started. We also know that you have made major efforts to help the authorities on the ground, activists across the country in Ethiopia, to find ways to resolve the conflict, to get out of it, if possible. Some of those efforts have worked to some degree, but perhaps not in the way that all of us had expect. What's blocking a solution right now? I mean, at least what we need is we need the will of those that are fighting to be on the side of talks, to be on the side of trying to address their, their grievances, their concerns through non-military means. We have said um, since the beginning of this administration that there is no military, con there is no military solution to this conflict. Um, even with the alarming developments of the, re of the recent days around, around Desi and, and, and Kompotka, we do not believe that either side um, it will be able to assert themselves militarily over the, over the entire country. They will not be able to win militarily. Mm -hmm. So we've been, we've been saying that, it, that one needs to look at other means. We're not getting much response. The, the military logic is still, is still prevailing. And, it, and it's, you know, it, and it is worrisome to see a continuation of military, of military advances by the TPLF, airstrikes by the, by the government against targets in Tigray that will only increase the human suffering when in the end there's going to have to be talks. So the sooner we get to talks, the better. The, the, the fewer people will, will suffer in Tigray and Amhara, the, the closer we get to talks. Um, and as I said in, in the remarks, it doesn't give us any pleasure we, to move in the direction of punitive measures toward those that are involved in the conflict. You know, it's unusual to have an executive order that, that um, authorizes sanctions announced with no targets. That's what happened in September. Um, and the reason why is because the reason why the president signed the executive order but didn't agree to, to target any, any individual or entity under the sanctions is because we wanted to give a chance to pivot into talks rather than, rather than um, continuation of the, middle, of the military logic. That hasn't happened. So I think you're, gonna, you're going to see us um, try to use other, other measures. In the end, there will be, there will be talks because neither side's going to win. But the sooner, that, the sooner that happens, the better for the, for the people of Ethiopia. I mean, our commitment to the people of Ethiopia. Um, Ambassador, you said something very interesting when you talked about the logic of war continuing to drive the calculations of all the parties. You held a very unique position in the world. You were the chief political advisor and negotiator for the United Nations with the remit across the globe. How do you switch that logic? How do you get belligerents to a conflict to change their calculations from being purely military to including a set of political options? Well, it, the, you know, you look at, you look at the, the courageous decisions that were taken, for example, by, by former Colombian president Juan Manuel Santos. That's right. You know, um, he decided to negotiate that he decided to open negotiations with the terrorist organization, the FARC. Um, this was not a popular move um, in Colombia. It was, the FARC was a hated group with, there were lots of victims of the FARC. Um, but yet he, he saw that for the, for the good of his country, military action alone would not wipe out the insurgency and would not lead to the type of, of sort of nonviolent atmosphere that he needed for economic development and job creation in, in, in rural parts of the country. So he took the courageous, he took a, a, a very courageous step in moving, in moving forward. And one of the things that we've talked about with the, with the Ethiopian leaders, um, be they government, be they, non, be they non government, is that there's different ways that one can do this. I understand why. Prime Minister Abiy would not wish to sit down across the table from a, TP, from a TPLF official, um, you know, giving the sort of status of equals. I understand that. Um, but you, you know from your own, own UN career, Lise, that there are many, many ways that one can initiate discrete talks. You go through third party. You, you have the, the sorts of 
they call them track 1.5, um, that allows you to think, cre think creatively. Um, one doesn't have to have, go to the, the, the UN headquarters in Geneva in these grand rooms with lots of cameras and lots of media. One can design a process that fits the needs. And that's what, the, that's what um, Prime, um, President Santos did with the Colombians with very, very quiet talks to start. We would, our, our message to the Ethiopian leaders um, is that we, can, we I'm saying, I say we, um, but it doesn't have to be the United States, but we can design a process that allows you to start moving toward reciprocal parallel steps that de-escalate the situation, prevents more suffering of the Ethiopian people, and can lead to a negotiated right. ceasefire. The trouble with the, you know, the prime minister, I think, was very impatient with us that we, that we didn't give proper credit to the June 28th ceasefire announcement that he, that, that he made. The problem with that ceasefire was twofold. First, it was combined with a, what's a de facto humanitarian siege of Tigray. You know, that, that was basically when the, when the access problems really, really started in earnest was after the June 28th. But the second was the ceasefire rules were not understood. Um, that ceasefires that work and that are durable and that can create the atmosphere for broader political talks need to have, need to have the rules understood by all parties. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that you're going to need some kind of third party to help work on those rules. But the two sides need to agree that they need a ceasefire, that they need the rules, that they're prepared to move it, to move in, in that direction. You know, over the long term, the, the Ethiopians um, need to have a type of national conversation among themselves. You know, the outsiders can provide support if they want it, but it's basically an Ethiopian conversation. What's the relationship of the federal states versus the central government? Um, you know, how do you have durable protection for minorities? These are not things the international community is going to decide. But to have this kind of, and, and the prime minister has said he wants a national dialogue. He has, he's talked about that. Um, our, our advice is your national dialogue will be more, more productive, more constructive if the atmosphere isn't marred by ongoing fighting. Let's find a way now to de-escalate, stop the fighting, have a negotiated ceasefire, lift the humanitarian siege of, and commercial siege of Tigray, get the TPLF out of Amhara so that you, you've basically addressed the immediate conflict to create the atmosphere that will allow the type of national dialogue on larger political issues that Prime Minister Abiy um, has, has said publicly he wants to see happen. Mm. Ambassador, we have a question from the media about weapons in Ethiopia. We understand that there are weapons from Turkey, from Iran, from other forces. This is fueling the conflict deeper. What is your view on this question and what can be done about it, if anything? Well, I think it's very sad that, um, that resources that could be used for development, for job creation, for, for helping the Ethiopian people are ending up being used for arms instead. You know, the, again, it's another reason why we should get to some kind of understanding that leads to a negotiated ceasefire so, so, that, so that the um, government doesn't feel the need to be purchasing arms from a variety of, from a variety of sources. You know, that there's other ways to address the concerns other than, than just military force. And of course, we're also bothered by the fact that there are reports that some, that some of these arms are being acquired from some of our adversaries. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there, will, there are consequences um, for you know, supporting some of these, some of these adversaries. But, it, but, the, but the, the, the primary way to stop the arms purchases is to stop the war. Ambassador, you spoke um, very movingly in your speech today about the humanitarian crisis, about the 20 million people who are facing famine because of... 20 million people need humanitarian assistance across Ethiopia. It's not all that... The, the famine is confined in the, in the north. 20 million people need across help. Ethiopia. You talked about the restrictions in aid reaching the people who need help. Has the international response been effective? What more can be done? Are there things that the U.S. government can do differently that will help to improve the humanitarian situation? I mean, we're having tough conversations with, with both the government and the, and the TPLF to make sure that we have... That, that the international community can have access to those who need humanitarian assistance wherever they are, whether they're in Amhara, whether they're in Afar, whether they're in, um, in Tigray. And, and I would argue that both sides have not, 
have not fully lived up to their responsibilities. The TPLF says that the aid has to go aid to um, to their to the parts of Amhara that they control have to go up via up via Mekali, which is just not realistic. It's it it complicates matters, and the government continues to find you know bureauc put bureaucratic obstacles in our in, you know in the way. Um, fighting there, fighting has disrupted some some humanitarian assistance without question. You can't, um, but the most most of the restrictions have been imposed by the government via, bureau via bureaucratic delays. The international community has spoken with one voice, um, including through, through joint approaches to the, to the government of Ethiopia on these, on these matters. Um, and we have to continue to push. The Secretary General has been outspoken. Your former Yemen colleague, Martin Griffiths, in his role as UN um, Emergency Humanitarian Coordinator has also, has also been quite active in, in, in trying to broker some understandings. What ends up happening is we spend a lot of time on this or that delivery while the overall problem That's remains. Right. That's right. Um, and I would hope that if, if, the, if the parties recognizing the fact that there's no military solution would move into some kind of proximity, third party mediation, to stop the fighting, that, that that's how we resolve ultimately the humanitarian access. But it's a really, really tough and it's unconscionable um, that the assistance is available and it's not getting to those who are in need. Yeah. Ambassador, when we were soliciting questions for this session, um, a number of people who have family in Ethiopia asked about the possibility that the U.S. would declare what's happening in the country a genocide. And they pointed to the extremely high levels of violence, including sexual and gender-based violence. Can you comment on that? Um, you know, this war has been going on now for almost a year. This conflict, this conflict broke out after sort of a period of brinkmanship between the government and the, and the regional government of, of Tigray. This conflict's been going on for about a year, and people have suffered tremendously. Um, the, re the, the reports of, of rape, looting, sexual violence, um, executions, dis displacement are horrifying, and it continues. Is, is what is even more horrifying. It's, it, it, it's not that this is all in the past and we have to only talk about accountability. We have to make sure that, that there aren't future crimes um, happening. And we're looking, we're reviewing this, all, the, all this very, very closely. Um, we, I note that this week is when the United Nations um, Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, Ethiopian Human Rights Commission joint report, a UN-Ethiopian joint report on human rights is, suppo is supposed to be released this week. I understand, I haven't, obviously haven't seen it yet. I understand there'll be recommendations. Um, and all parties to this conflict need to be um, showing, demonstrating that they're implementing those recommendations right away. Um, and we ourselves will take into account as we make our own determinations of how to describe what's happened, the, the horrors that have happened to the Ethiopian people, we'll take into account this, uh, account this joint report. You know, the Ethiopian people who have suffered are going to want to see, are going to want to see some kind of, of, mm -hmm. of justice, some kind of reckoning right. for, for the horrors that they've, that they've been through because of this, this, this needless conflict. Um, and we will, we, you know, we will be looking to encourage the type of, of accountability and justice that would, that would, that the Ethiopian people have every right to expect. Ambassador, you talked about the role of the African Union side representative Obasanjo and the efforts that he's making. And you talked about the support in your role as the U.S. Special Envoy that you're providing. How is the collaboration going? And allow us, the question that came to us had a point to it. There was a sharp end to it. Allow us to share that. Very often in the past, the U.S. has often said in conflict, we're the leader in this. We're going to resolve this. We want others to follow the efforts that we're going to make. How is this playing out in the case of Ethiopia? I think, I think the African Union um, having a high representative, I think that was an important initiative. That the, that, that the you know, Ethiopia is, you know, is a leading influential country in Africa. And of course, it's the host of the, of the African Union. Um, and for the African Union to be expressing its concern about um, the conflict in Ethiopia, to be looking for ways to um, address 
the grievances and end the conflict, I think is 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 good. It's positive. You know, there's the state. There's the saying saying that the African um, leaders. Um, like to repeat, which is African solutions for African African mm. problems. You know, the Africans Africans know Ethiopia better than we know Ethiopia, um, without question. And what we, and we've ha I've had several conversations with President with with President Obasanjo in his high representative role. We, um, Secretary Blinken met with him here in Washington. We had a we had a a virtual meeting. With Secretary Blinken, President Obasanjo, with um, some other some other leaders, in, um, including EU High Representative Vice President Borrell. Um, and we've all pledged our support for for Obasanjo's for President Obasanjo's mission. Um, what I the way I describe the way I sort of said to President Obasanjo is, look, we can we can play a backstage role um, to your efforts. We don't we're not looking for the spotlight on the United States. What we're looking for is what's the most effective way to end this conflict. What's the what's the most constructive role that the United States can play? completely behind the scenes, if that's, if that's most appropriate, to support um, President, Obasanjo's, President Obasanjo's efforts. Um, I'm, I'm repeating myself, Lise, but you know this so well from your, from your UN tenure. The process of getting to a negotiated ceasefire um, can be developed in a way that takes into account the, po the political concerns of the two sides I'm talking about the government, the TPLF in this case, may have about dealing with each other that deal with that, that can try to deal with the distrust. And President Obasanjo, as a respected African leader, can play an important role in helping to put together a process that's acceptable for both sides. Ambassador, we all know that relations between Ethiopia and Eritrea have gone through periods of great difficulty. There have been some improvements. Many problems remain. How do you see Eritrea's role in the current conflict in Ethiopia. Extremely damaged and destructive role. And it's interesting. I, um, I was in Asmara in May and was able to, was able to have a long conversation with uh, President Osayas, um, mostly him giving his perspective to me. Um, but what was interesting was that he shared his, you know, shared his concerns about the overall stability of the Ethiopian state, which is a concern we had, I mentioned at the end of our, end of our statement. It's not just that Northern Tigray, it's that there's a lot of tensions that the prime minister needs to manage throughout Ethiopia. But the role that, that, that um, President Asayas Afwerke and Eritrea are playing in Ethiopia exacerbates hmm. the insecurity, exacerbates the tensions, exacerbates the risks to the integrity of the Ethiopian state. And some of the, according to the documentation that we have, some of the absolute worst, most horrifying human rights violations um, were committed by the Eritrean Defense Forces mm -hmm. um, during, the, during the period between you know, the, the start of this conflict back in November 2020 and, and June when the, when the ENDF pulled out of, of most of, uh, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces pulled out of most of, of, of northern Ethiopia. Um, so... You know, we will continue to call for the Eritrean forces to withdraw entirely from Ethiopia because they are, their role is destructive, making things worse. Ambassador, finally, in conclusion, in your very powerful comments and speech, there was one statement that I think many of us immediately woke up to. You said that on average, every civil war takes 20 years to resolve. Yes, and the, the Ethiopian people do not deserve after you know they've had again they've had some dark days in their in their 20th century history they do not they do not deserve spending the next 19 years trying to address a con trying to um, address a conflict through military means that undermines the integrity of the state you, you look at you look at what a rich mosaic of people's Ethiopia Ethiopia is you could very well imagine that a um, that the tensions that are here and there throughout the country, you know, violence in Beni Shango Gumu, some problems in Oromia, that these, that these problems, if, they left, if they're left unaddressed because there's such focus on Northern Ethiopia, could evolve into a widespread civil war. And imagine the ramifications mm -hmm. beyond Ethiopia, not only for the Ethiopian people, but even beyond Ethiopia. As, as, you know, across the Red Sea, as you would have people, people trying to find, you know, get out of a, of a situation of 20 year civil war. Um, there are again. There are ways to address the prime minister's con 
concerns. There are ways to address the TPLF concerns. I don't, you know, the, the prime minister, I believe, thinks that, or, or thinks that the TPLF wants to wants to replace him. TPLF thinks that the prime minister wants to probably exterminate them. I don't think either is true. So you can you can find a way where the where the the you could meet the needs of the government as the national government of Ethiopia and the TPLF in its regional government role that aren't mutually exclusive. It's just that you have to have the will of the parties in order to start. Ambassador, we're at the end of our discussion today. I hope you will allow a very personal comment. You are one of the most exceptional Under Secretary Generals of Political Affairs that the UN has had in its 75 year history. We could not be in better hands to have someone of your exceptional capability as the U.S. Special Envoy to the Horn of Africa. I hope everyone joins me in thanking the ambassador for his very important comments today. Jeff, thank you.